Grace and peace be yours from God our Sovereign and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we continue our reading of the Easter Gospels with the question, what do they mean for those folks who may read them seriously but not necessarily literally? This morning our focus and emphasis is on Peter. Now I think for even the most casual reader of the scriptures, this one is not hard to interpret. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, is now being asked by the risen Christ if he loves Jesus three times. And after each response, he is instructed to feed the sheep. It doesn't take a biblical genius or a literary expert to understand that this passage is all about reconciliation. Peter, estranged by his actions from Christ, Peter is being reconciled to Jesus, whom he denied. But is that all there is here, or is there more? <coughs> Throughout the Gospels, Peter serves as a foil against which the discipleship journey is told. He is brash, he is opinionated, and he is very, very human. He was the first to proclaim Jesus as Messiah. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? It was Peter who quickly jumps in and responds that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But if you read the whole story, you find out that that confession turns out to have carried all of the right words, but it had all of the wrong interpretation of what Messiah means. And when Jesus explains the true nature of his Messiahship, that is, that he is going to suffer and die, Peter ends up getting into an argument with him, which ends up with Jesus calling Peter Satan. Peter is also the first of the disciples to recognize Jesus in the story about Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. And Peter is so human and so full of himself and so bold and brash that he actually gets out of the boat to go and meet Jesus on the water, only to be overcome with fear when a wave approaches them. Peter also carries a sword and may well have been torn between following Jesus and his way on the one hand or joining the zealots in order to truly fight for righteousness and to defeat evil in the world on the other hand. And so it is in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus says that his disciples will desert him. It is Peter who swears, though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. And it is then that Jesus tells Peter that before the cock crows twice, he will have denied Jesus three times. And when Jesus is arrested, it appears that Peter will stand his ground and honor the oath that he just swore, and not deny nor desert Jesus, but rather indeed will fight to protect him. 
in what appears to be the moment of truth for Peter, he actually draws his sword to stand his ground. And it is there that Jesus makes clear that this is not the way of the reign of God. His words to Peter are, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Peter does indeed follow Jesus to the courthouse of the high priest following Jesus' arrest, but there his courage and his convictions begin to falter. For here, when he is identified as being with Jesus, he denies it. And after that first denial, the cock crows. And then a second time, he is accused of being a Galilean, a follower of Jesus. Again, Peter denies it. <coughs> Finally, after a third accusation, Peter began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. And no sooner had that oath left his lips than the cock crowed a second time. Now, following the trial in the Synoptic Gospels, the disciples are nowhere to be seen. They all desert Jesus. They abandon the cross, and they all go into hiding, where they will remain until at least Easter morning, when they are told by Mary Magdalene that Jesus was missing from the tomb. Then a few of them leave their place of hiding and they go to investigate the tomb. And finding it as Mary had told them, they return to hiding and there they remain, at least until Easter evening when Jesus comes and appears to them through locked doors. But Peter is prominent in the Gospels. And in this chapter, in John's Gospel, he is the focus of Jesus' message of reconciliation. Now there is obviously some time that passes between John 20 and John 21 because the scene shifts from that room in Jerusalem to Galilee. From a locked room to fishing once again on the lake. But in the previous chapter, in chapter 20, it is Peter and John who go to the tomb on Easter morning. And there's a big deal made of the fact that John gets there first, but he waits until Peter arrives at the tomb. And Peter goes in first. And much is made of that in terms of Peter's supremacy among the disciples. However, I think those passages are more about the written record of the victors in the theological skirmishes of the early church for superiority, and it reflects their biases rather than any actual factuality. But it is this scene and Peter's threefold reconciliation that is the primary message for us. For you see, in one sense, Peter is every person. Every would-be disciple of Jesus. Everyone who longs for a better world. Everyone who sees in Jesus the true answer for the transformation of this world. Peter stands for everyone who swears allegiance to following the way of Christ. 
but who from time to time find themselves equally torn between submitting to the way of the cross rather than fighting evil on their own terms. Peter is every person, every person who is filled with good intentions, who when confronted with the cost of discipleship fails to measure up and falls back on the easy way of denying the truth and relying on force. In spite of the fact that Jesus says, it shall not be that way among you. Clearly, if there is any one character in the Gospel stories who epitomizes the struggle between following the way of the cross or following the way of the world, it is Peter. It's not that he is enamored with the way of the world, but rather that he chooses the world's weapons with which to engage evil. And here we see ourselves in both his zeal for righteousness, his desire to get rid of evil, and in his fear of the cross or the consequences of following the way of Jesus. Here we, like Peter, often succumb to using the world's weapons to fight what we perceive to be evil. I don't think there's a character in all the scripture who captures the essence of our own struggles more than Peter does. And I think that we understand that. That's why during Lent when we sing that hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus, how hast thou offended, that every one of us will sing with passion and grief, was I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied thee, I crucified thee. Peter is every would-be disciple. <coughs> and here's the point of it all. Jesus' message to Peter is simply this. Peter, in spite of all your failures, and in spite of all your stumbling, in spite of all your bad choices, get over it, Peter. You tried the world's way and you failed. Again, and again, and again. Get over it. And get on with serving me and following me. Quit wallowing in your self-pity. Quit your self-condemnation. Stand up, dust yourself off, get on with the business of ministry. That's the real message here. But oh, how we like Peter like to wallow in our self-pity. We like to pretend that our sins are special and unique. Well, I want to say to you this morning that I think the church has made way too much, way too much, over this business of sin and confession and forgiveness. 